Welcome to the Natural Health Revolution, a weekly podcast that focuses on bringing science and nature together by bringing you the top experts from the fields of science, health, nutrition, and well-being. We are Circle of Light, bringing you wholesome, all-natural ingredients to help you on your journey to long-term well-being. Take care of your gut health with our delicious Fibre 89 soluble drinks. Reap the nutritious, natural benefits of the unroasted green coffee bean with our unique green coffee range. And restore your body with our all-natural herbal night drink, Triple Z. Choose health the natural way. I'm Dr. Sarah Kelly, CEO of Circle of Light. Join us as we dig into all things health and find some inspiration along the way. Today, we are speaking to someone who has embodied the idea of using your knowledge for good and to give back to the community. Dr. Noel McCaffrey is a sport and exercise medicine specialist and consultant in sports medicine in Kappa Hospital. Drawing on his medical background and years of academic research, Dr. McCaffrey spearheaded the development of XWell Medical, a program that provides effective community exercise classes for people with chronic illness. Dr. McCaffrey has been providing supervised exercise classes and nutrition services to patients with a range of chronic illness since 2006. To me, he has been a lecturer, a mentor, and a source of infinite knowledge and support during my time as a student and later member of faculty at DCU. So I am delighted to have him with us today. Hello, Noel. Thank you so much for taking the time out to be with us today. I know you're extremely busy, so I'm delighted to get a chance to sit down and chat with you. So let's go back to the beginning. Tell me, what brought you to study medicine in UCD and then later to go on to study sports medicine in London? Well, hi, Sarah, and thanks for having me. Um, My entry into medicine was for the good old reason that I had enough points to do it. So there was no tradition of medicine in our family. And I was one of those many people, I think, actually, who ended up doing medicine for the wrong reason, but turning out to love it. So truly, I just did it, wasn't sure what to do. And I had the points and I uh, applied and got it. And equally, when I graduated as a doctor, I also hadn't a clue what I wanted to do as a doctor. And I think that's also a very common event that many medical students graduate without the foggiest notion which area of medicine they want to study. And the thing about medicine is there's a place in it for everyone. Even if you never want to talk to a person again, there's a place for you in some niche area of medicine. So I sort of um, went back and did a BSc in physiology, having graduated, and then I started a medical SHO rotation. And I remember I was working in the Richmond Hospital and I just jumped ship and told my boss that I wanted to go off and do a diploma in sports medicine in London, probably because I was just heavily involved in sport. Did that, then spent a couple of years in London working in an exercise lab and then came back and worked in the A&E hospital in the A&E department in um, the matter for six months and then set up a sports clinic linked with the old, with the O'Neill's sports clothing firm, which was a follow-on actually from a clinic that had been run by Tony O'Neill, the famous Tony O'Neill, who was at one stage the chief executive of the FAI. And Tony O'Neill was nothing to do with O'Neill's. They weren't related, nor was Pat O'Neill related to any of them. And the, the whole thing got quite confusing at times. But anyway, I ran that clinic and then went off and took a job in um, UCD for for a while. And then that led on to various other things and exercise medicine sort of took over by degrees. I started off with a big interest in musculoskeletal medicine, which is injuries, but by degrees I have become much more interested in exercise medicine. Yeah, and this was actually a point I was going to make in spite of your huge interest in sport you now spend a large percentage of your time working with people or individuals with chronic disease. And I suppose for people who may not be overly familiar with the term, can you tell us what's meant or how would you define chronic disease? So a chronic illness is an illness which lasts for a long time. It is often described as non-communicable. So it's sort of not contagious. It's not like an infection um, which you can pass from one person to another. So a chronic illness by definition is one that does not go away. So examples are arthritis or heart disease or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or diabetes or many, many illnesses like that, um, which you're stuck with when you get them. And the uh, imperative around treating these illnesses is to manage them in such a way that enhances quality of life rather than aspiring to get rid of the illness, which is by and large not possible because of the definition of chronic illness. So 
I mean, chronic illness is the biggest public health challenge facing our country and many other first world countries. Um, the prevalence of chronic illness is 40% of the entire population, including up to 22% of children. Um, it's common in lower socioeconomic groups, it's common in older people. So the HSE data produced back in 2016 would have told us that 84% of people over the age of 65 have one chronic illness and 64% have two. And as the population is ageing, that demographic will ensure that the challenge presented by chronic illness management is going to grow and grow and grow. And the whole Slauncher Care principle is to shift chronic illness management out of hospital settings, which are a scarce resource and very expensive, into community settings. And that's where we sit. Um, the operation that I run at the moment is called Exwell Medical, which is a sort of a social enterprise which aspires to transform the lives of people with chronic illness and of their families, actually, through the provision of structured exercise offerings, either face-to-face -face or online. Brilliant. Can you give a little bit of an insight, I suppose, what it's like for people after a diagnosis or living with a chronic disease? Do you find that they may have fears or anxieties around physical exertion or exercise maybe after an event or after diagnosis? Well, you're right. Um, I suppose it varies a lot depending on the chronic illness. So a chronic illness could be anxiety. A chronic illness could be osteoarthritis of your hip. Um, a chronic illness could be inflammatory bowel disease, which may be intermittent, but it tends to be with you for a long time. So how people sort of process a change in life that occurs with a chronic illness assuming there is a change in their lifestyle, because sometimes there isn't. Um, it's very much down to the person. Um, but in a general way, if you have a significant chronic illness, it is the fact that these people become less physically active than others. Now, everybody becomes less active as we get older. And as we say at all of our induction sessions to, you know, prospective XL participants, um, a small bit of that is inevitable because the muscles get older, but the vast majority of the becoming less active as you get older is completely unnecessary. It's completely avoidable. It's a profoundly bad idea, but we all do it. Now, people with chronic illness become even less active than the rest of us, and the reasons for that are interesting. And one you've just touched on is that people with chronic illness become apprehensive about exercise. They develop a feeling that exercise is bad for their condition which is not true. And in particular, they become anxious about feeling breathless. This experience of breathlessness becomes a fear. And we ask this all the time and they keep telling us that they don't like that. And our message to people with long-term illness is there's nothing wrong with being breathless. In fact, it's a good idea once it's not extreme. And being breathless is a perfectly normal experience and it's actually quite enjoyable once it's not extreme. And if you can just persuade people to buy into that, it's a big, big hurdle. And not only do we not want you to avoid breathlessness, or we do not want you to avoid becoming breathless, we want you to strive to become breathless to a modest extent. And that's a key part of the XWELL method um, in terms of one of the elements of prescribing exercise is how hard should you go? And the answer is until you're modestly breathless. And if you take that system aligned with have you a red face? Are you a bit sweaty? That is just as accurate as measuring heart rates. And we know this because we've researched it. That if you use the show me the red face method and you measure the heart rate, the heart rate is exactly where it should be. Um, so that, that sort of self-monitoring of exercise intensity in a clinical exercise program is very accurate. But the other thing that happens with chronic illness is that because of the reduced physical activity over time, people become deconditioned. And that has the effect over time of bringing about social isolation because all aspects of fitness disimprove. They lose their strength. And whether the strength decreases rapidly or slowly, at some point it'll cross the threshold below which people notice it. And if it's your pelvic muscles or your thigh muscles, it means you become unable easily to stand up. Therefore, you can't get off the toilet seat, you can't get out of bed, you can't get out of a car. You can't live on your own. And if you lose your flexibility, another aspect of your fitness, you become unable to do your hair, do your shoe, get a cup off the top shelf, somebody has to do it for you. If you lose your aerobic fitness, what happens is you become unable to do aerobic exercise, which by definition is exercise involving large muscle groups, like your biceps or your quads, in rhythmic activity, like running, cycling, swimming for long periods of time, more than 10 minutes, 
And the inability to do that is reflected in becoming unable to do the housework, to do the gardening, to walk the mass, to walk the dog, to leave your house. So that over time, a person with a long term illness tends to become socially isolated. And we often ask them to reflect on what were you like five years ago compared with now? And would you recognise a different person, somebody who was back then more enthusiastic, more energetic, sleeping better, eating better, seeing more people, happier? And they just nod in agreement. But it happens so slowly that there isn't an immediate transition or a step from one status to the other. And that social isolation brings with it loneliness and mental health issues, which defines the unwellness that goes with chronic illness of any sort. So the the social isolation is in large part a result of the physical deconditioning, no matter what the illness. And the beauty of clinical exercise is that we can fix it. We can reverse it or substantially reverse it no matter what the illness is and no matter how long you've had the illness for, no matter how frail the person is, once the person buys into it and is willing to give it a try and we're not trying to fix the illness. Just improve quality of life. Yeah. I I suppose I'm quite familiar with the programmes, I suppose having worked with some of your cardiovascular disease patients during my PhD. But for other people, how could you describe what the programme actually looks like? Like what, what does a class entail or how do people get involved? Well, the Exwell class has changed a lot in the last two years because of the pandemic. <laughs> and it's evolved a lot actually over time for other reasons as well. But essentially, a clinical, well, the, the clinical exercise offering that we bring to people is that they attend a class and the class contains three key elements. It contains aerobic exercise, strength, work and core stability. Those are the three elements. And any class that anybody attends in our service will have those three elements in it, preceded by a warm-up, followed by a cool-down. The class will last 45 minutes to an hour, depending. So there's loads of ways of doing that. And there's no IP particularly on exercise. There's nothing, like, unique about the exercise that we do compared with the exercise that anybody else might offer. What is a bit unique, I suppose, is the medical oversight, which we can talk about again in a minute, but... People will come and they will take part in exercise that gives those three elements. So whether it's jumping jacks or jogging on the spot or swiveling or you know rhythmic move, arm movement, whatever, it doesn't matter what it is. Um, there is a way of offering those three elements to everybody. Now, when we started off, you will remember that we had a program for heart disease and a different program for lung disease and a different program for what's called peripheral vascular disease or intermittent claudication. And what became clear over time is that the programs were all the same. Everybody needed and got the same components. But the challenge was offering the service to people of different abilities in the same class, no matter what the illness was. Now, there's ways of doing that within the same class. That is, we can accommodate people of different abilities in the same class. And I have a great memory of when we were dealing with big groups in the, in the room at the same time, which is no longer the case, we might have had 70 people in a big room. And at the end of the class, we would divide them into lines. At the end of the hall, there might be seven or eight lines of 10 people. And those on one side who struggled to walk or were using a Zimmer were marching up and down. And on the other side of the room, people were running. And it was the most magnificent buzz, um, excitement, sense of unity. um, But it was quite possible to have different abilities in the same room. But what we've moved towards now, among other things, is offering a gentle class, a standard class, an advanced class. So we now organise our classes based on functional ability, not on illness, with some exceptions. Um, So, for example, cancer, the cancer cohort really benefited a lot in our experience from staying together because of the incredible peer support, the emotional support which comes within that group. And it is immediate once they sit down at an induction within five minutes, there are new friendships and deep conversations going on about their own journeys. And it's obvious and it happens every single time we do it. And um, there is merit also in, for example, some particular clinical conditions like peripheral vascular disease, which is like angina of the leg, where the arteries into the leg are damaged or diseased or narrowed so that what you get when you exercise the leg muscles by walking, demanding more oxygen and increased blood supply, which is unavailable because of the disease in the artery, you get pain in the leg, just like you get pain in the heart with um, coronary artery disease, where the heart muscle 
when it's asked to work harder during exercise and pump more blood, it can't do it properly because the blood vessels supplying the heart muscle itself are damaged. Therefore, when that heart muscle works harder without enough oxygen, the net effect is pain, and that is angina. Likewise, in claudication, you get pain in the leg on exercise, which stops when you stop walking and it starts again when you resume walking. But therein lies a solution because one of the known ways to treat that is to walk through the pain, to walk to pain and through the pain. And it is it is appropriate to design a clinical exercise session for that group based on walking mainly and walking through the pain. And interestingly, walking on a treadmill is not the same as walking not on a treadmill. So that we over the years would have been quite puzzled by the observation made repeatedly by people that their walking on the treadmill improved when they walked on the treadmill, but when they went walking in the park, it made not a blind bit of difference. And that is now, I was quite reassured recently to hear that reported in a scientific conference that this observation was coming back repeatedly. So there's something different about walking on a treadmill versus walking outdoors. And is it the uneven terrain of a park or...? I don't know what it is, but but the point is Mm. that... um, the construct of a class for this group is very interesting and we tried it a bit in, in some of our previous programs and we would have this hilarious scenario where we would have people walking up and down and we would say, put your hand up when you get pain and we would cheer them on when they got the pain and now <laughs> let's keep going a bit further. And it is, to my knowledge, the only situation where doctors actually seek pain in a patient. I, I'm not aware of any other and it's appropriate and it's very interesting. Um, so anyway, by and large, we now organise our classes based on functional ability. But the other thing that's happened um, in recent years, obviously, is with pandemic, there's been fundamental changes in the way we do things. So the first thing that happened was we were flying high and very busy. And in March of last year, the whole thing stopped for six months. And that was with group classes, big classes, um, sharing equipment, no social distancing, all that, you know, um, and then when, so during the six months when we were shut, we, we pivoted to online. We found we weren't very good at it. We also found that the people didn't like it as much by and large, although some did. They just missed being together. Um, but we did it and we became competent at it. And then in September, um, we got back to group classes, but they were small pods of six or thereabouts. So you could have two or three pods in a room. So it's, you know, instead of being 70 people, it was 15. Um, and th- that worked fine. And then... There was another shutdown. And instead of shutting down, we got permission from the HSC to continue operating, which was a great endorsement of what we did because effectively our classes were viewed as clinical appointments. But we went outdoors and that was an incredible discovery because the patients loved it. They just loved it. They were outdoors. They felt resilient. They felt strong. When it rained, we had a few gazebos we pulled out. People were, And the thing is, people walking by, walking their dogs, were suddenly looked at this, said, what is going on here? And it normalised the whole thing and it was brilliant. And that was one of the most important things that we learnt. And then more recently, we were involved in a very interesting pilot study in the northeastern city where we ran it outdoors in the grounds of Sean McDermott Street Church. And what we discovered about the inner city residents were A, they were a different mix entirely because we had immigrants and asylum seekers and some homeless and some drug addicts as well as the inner city residents. But the point is that the inner city residents are distinctive in that they, they won't travel very far for health services so that it was very comical. We were told they wouldn't even cross Eamon Street from Sheriff Street to Summer Hill and they wouldn't go from Ballybock to Summer Hill so that it was, it really was necessary to bring it to their doorstep. So therein lies another evolution in the modelling of our service by which I mean we hope now to offer a very mobile service so we might do two sessions a week in one parish and rather than try to do ten sessions a week in that centre we'll do two more a few miles away in a different centre. So that's been very interesting. So, so, so the way it works is that a patient is referred from their GP or their from the GP okay. or a healthcare professional or a social prescriber or other sources, and we are trying to broaden that referral network to make it to include what we call self-initiated referral, not quite self-referral, because we do want some medical information. Um, they then attend an induction session at which sort of I or one of my colleagues would try to sort of beat the drum and explain why it's a good idea and enthuse them about it and explain the rationale for it and the safety considerations, and we would then do some baseline testing. And the testing is very important because we might think it's a great program, but unless we actually prove it, we can't make that claim. 
Um, so we do some very simple field-based measures of strength, aerobic fitness, flexibility, and a questionnaire-based assessment of quality of life. And we repeat those tests at intervals and we do our best to give a report to the participant and to the participant's referrer. And that's the way the system works. And it has allowed us to make the case um, that the product we offer is effective. So, for example, we recently have been working in City West in the HSC centre, the vaccination centre, and... When we got the opportunity to go there, we suddenly found from our waiting list we had 300 people recruited in one week to get cracking at it. We have been working off between, you know, 400 and 500 visits per week. And we did a baseline test and a six-week test on 300 participants and we're just delighted to be able to state that after six weeks, which we had not looked at before, there were dramatic improvements in all of these measures which in some cases exceeded what's called the minimal clinically important difference, which is the MCID. It's a sort of a, an important threshold of improvement because it, um, or magnitude of improvement, because it indicates that that level of improvement makes a difference, right? So A, it happened quickly. B, it exceeded the MCID in a few of the measures. And C, it, the benefits were most dramatic in those who started off the worst. Now, we would have known that intuitively anyway, but it was powerful stuff to have on record in a report um so the whole thing with impact measurement is that it allows you to verify that your product is effective or not it provides motivation and feedback to the participants and to the referrers and it also builds a case for funders like the hse um to see the value in um funding this because no matter what we do until we got that funding from the hse up in city west we had to charge the patients to take part and payment is a barrier that was actually going to be my next question. How do you deal with the challenge, I suppose, of trying to keep people in the programme? So is adherence with every, like at every stage of life, I think adherence to an exercise or training regime is is difficult. So how do you manage the, or keeping people well, interested and enrolled in the programme? Yeah, it's a very, it's a, it's a difficult one because like dropout in any public health intervention is common. Mm -hmm. That's the first thing. And it can be as high as 50% standard, like in any public health intervention. And the interesting thing is, well, why do people drop out? And um, there's all sorts of reasons, like lack of family support, um, lack of confidence, transport, funding, you know, other illness, caring for the family members. There's all sorts of things that can intervene. Um, so we are trying to address that, well, to investigate it and address it by simply making a phone call to people who don't show up within a few weeks and we're actually asking them to consent at the start of the programme to allow us to do that. So that's important. And um, at the other end, when the programme finishes, now our programme doesn't finish, anybody can stay as long as they want. But if somebody does stop, then the issue is slippage of benefit. Are the benefits sustained over time? And while we don't have, we don't have in our own situation, strong data to call on yet, the likelihood is that, that the benefits will disappear. So another evolution in, our, in what we're doing is to offer people refresher courses, just two or three week hit, maybe twice a year to just remind you what to do, you know. Um, and people, people will leave for all sorts of reasons. They may go to Australia to visit their children and their grandchildren and they may be gone for a year or two and we need to have an open, easy way to come back in. Or they may get a new illness. We may have dealt with them for cancer before and then for something else mm -hmm. two years later. Um, and then just slipping out of the habit as well as and slipping out yeah. of the habit. Although, mind you, the thing about habit is that if you manage to instill the habit of exercise in people, they tend not to want to stop. The problem is that being inactive is also a habit and trying to switch from one to the other is the challenge. And that's where a safe environment helps, you know, where, there, where there's a perception of it being safe and enjoyable. So I suppose that brings me on to the social bit. The social piece is just so important. It's almost as important, maybe even more important than the exercise. And that was a question I was going to ask you. You talked about the physical benefits that you measured at zero and six weeks. Is there any other measurements or any other benefits that aren't physical that you are aware of? Well, we just, we, uh, there are loads of ways of measuring mm -hmm. self-competence or, you know, but the EQ5D is a sort of a general self-assessment of my health and including psychological health, you know. Um, so you ask people on that scale from zero to 100, like just what, where would you put yourself today? If 100 means you could never, ever, ever imagine possibly feeling better, you know, when zero was the opposite, where would you put So it's simply that sort of, it encompasses physical and mental and emotional elements of health. 
So that's how we do that. And the social element is a huge for people coming back. I remember that even from my time working with the participants. It was all about the cup. Does it still get the cup of tea and the biscuit after? No, actually. And the oh. cup of tea was eliminated during the pandemic, but it's about oh. to be reintroduced. Okay. Um, that's is. a big loss. Yes, it was a big loss. It was very sad, actually. Uh, but anyway, it's on the way back. Good. And the biscuit. <laughs> and the biscuit. And the biscuit. Circle of Light brings you a range of wholesome, all-natural health drinks to guide you on your journey to long-term well-being. Our unroasted green coffee, Fibre 89 and Triple Z will help you choose health the natural way. So you mentioned City West there, but what other locations? So I know it started off in one, but you grown a lot since we last spoke. Yeah, so at the moment, Exwell operates in Clontarf and the Irish Wheelchair Association, a fantastic group of colleagues and partners and a lot of synergy, you can imagine, between the two, the clientele. In fact, we're just about to embrace involvement of some of the IWA's membership in our programme, which is fantastic. We operate in Dunleer at Down, um, in Lockness Town Leisure Centre with a fantastic team out there, led by Neil Cole and his team who are who had for a long time run their own sort of phase four cardiac rehab program and then partnered with us. We have elsewhere in Dublin, we're in, well, City West is our Tala location. We were previously elsewhere in Tala and will be elsewhere in Tala when, whenever the City West program finishes. And the other place we are in Dublin is in Abbottstown in the National Sports Campus. So anybody who hasn't been there, it's the new National Indoor Arena. It's like going into Star Trek. It is just simply astonishing. And we have a great relationship there. So that's four centres of Dublin. And then there's the inner city, um, the North East Inner City Project. And we're about to get involved in one, a new project called Heart of Our City, which is a collaboration between the Irish Heart Foundation and the Smart D8 group and... Novartis is a funder on ourselves so that's another inner city location and then outside Dublin we're in Kilkenny in the watershed we're in Waterford in WIT Arena we're in um, Athlone in the Athlone Regional Sports Centre in collaboration with the Midlands Hospital Group we're also in Balbriggan in collaboration with Fingal County Council and the local medical, one of the local medical practices up there. And are you actively seeking appropriate centres around to partner well, with? Our mission is to bring Exwell everywhere. One of the really interesting partnerships we did in Balbriggan very recently was with the fantastic The Knowledge GA Club where we ran a pilot there, which has led on to the, to the Balbriggan and that was a wonderful success. And GA Clubs are a great venue for an Exwell type programme because... Well, GA clubs are, by nature, part of the community and they would, inherently in their DNA, it's to enrich the lives of members and parents of members and friends of parents of members. And a lot of them have very, very nice facilities which are, which are empty during the day. And so there's, and there is a model there for expansion which the GA itself is interested in. Colin Regan has expressed support for this concept and Colin runs the Healthy Club Project in the GA. So... Um, and there isn't a town in the country that doesn't have a GA club. <laughs> this is true. This is true. So that's one option. Yeah. Partnering with other academic institutions that have programs with students who need experience in this and are interested in it because the number of times we've dealt with um, undergraduate sports science students who have come to us on placement with the ambition to become the next strength and conditioning coach in Liverpool or somewhere and have gone out a few months later transformed, wondering how can I do this as a career? You know, and it's very, it's really great to see that because by and large, they're all brilliant. They become very quickly part of our team and they are mission critical to running the service, not just looking at it. And that's what they get such um, personal development from it, such confidence from it. And there's a career in it because there's, if there was a thousand centres of doing this work around the country, it wouldn't be enough. And I can vouch for that because I was one of those undergrad sports science and health undergrads that thought I wanted to work with elite athletes and it was absolutely exposure to the XWell programmes that I realised there's so much um, that it interested me more. So I suppose I often say, would you rather help someone run, you know, a fraction of a second faster or help someone maybe, you know, extend their life or extend the quality or improve the quality of life? So yeah, it abs- it's a fabulous um thing for undergrads to get involved in yeah it really is and as you say there's plenty of work or could be plenty of work there there definitely is and the other thing to just go back to a little bit is the with chronic illness when somebody is quite ill in the family there is somebody's caring for them and um, or a number of people are caring for them and that caring role has a burden of its finance its time and it's emotional and it's not uncommon at all for us to see people who are 
in that role and they are distressed, but they don't want to show it because it'll make the person that they're caring for feel worse. So that is a challenge in itself. And I think there's a lot of hidden distress in caring for chronic illness. And one of the great joys for us in um, in Exwell is to see the restoration of hope and joy and mobility to, let's call it the patient, and the relief and hope and gratitude in family members as well. Um, And it's hard to measure that, um, but it's there. The distress is there and the resolution of distress is there when improvement is seen. And if someone is listening and there are a family member is listening and they're, I suppose, they're picking up on some of the diseases you mentioned, are there other illnesses that can benefit from these programmes that maybe apart from chronic illness? Well, what we deal with is chronic illness. And but chronic illness, like there's so much of it. There's not a strict definition as such. Well, well there is. It's any condition which is long term. So that includes Parkinson's and MS and the ataxia is on the neurology side. It's stroke victims, it's traumatic brain injury, it's chronic pain. It's the metabolic conditions, diabetes and other ones, hypothyroidism, all of these. It's musculoskeletal issues like degenerative arthritis. Like there is no end to it. There really is no. And then there are conditions which are in theory not chronic, by which I mean they will resolve or could resolve. And that's some of the cancers. But the other area for exercise medicine to be applied is in many conditions which require treatment but are not long-standing. So, for example, elective surgery for your gallbladder or your varicose veins or other sort of non-life-threatening conditions. Those people, or if you're getting a new hip, right, those people need to prepare for surgery to minimise the risks that attend that surgery. So to reduce fear of surgery, first of all, to shorten the stay in hospital, to reduce the risk of perioperative complications and to hasten the post-operative recovery. Um... So that's an entirely different area, almost. But we have this vision as well of a thing called an exercise hospital concept where, let's say you enter the matter and you walk in the front door and you're immediately barraged by just messages around the importance of exercise and you see people on the long corridors. There's almost like a sleet and a slant where you're exercising or there's a very visible gym through the glass where the staff and patients are exercising. And every appointment you go to before you go there you get your letter or your email saying, please fill in this questionnaire about your exercise or do this self-assessment of your exercise and here's how you do it. There's the video you go to on our website that shows you how to do this self-administered six-minute walk test or a sit-to-stand test. And if you don't do it yourself, we'll do it when you get here. You'll come a half an hour early and we'll do the testing for you and everybody will see you doing it and the results will be sitting on the consultant's table before he or she meets you and he or she will know what it means and will discuss it with you and if you're waiting for your surgery you will be expected if necessary based on the findings to undertake an appropriate exercise program and you'll be told how to do it and when you come back for your pre-operative visit you'll be asked about it and that culture of um, normalizing exercise and bringing it to the very top of the agenda is becoming a very mainstream and it's manifesting itself in Um, Things like enhanced recovery programs, which are now becoming routine for almost all, say, lung transplant patients. There's a methodology around this now. And in the matter, when you wake up having had your lung transplant, the first thing you'll see is the exercise bike beside the bed. And you'll be invited to get on it as quickly as possible. And that is now becoming very mainstream and recognised as being as important as other aspects of managing the illness at that time. And what's really great is that a number of our specialist colleagues will not now, it's becoming very routine to refer patients preoperatively to our service and um, it's becoming embedded as normal care and it's almost an opt-out rather than an opt-in, which is great and that's the way it should go. And is the attitude of, in I suppose, from medical professionals towards what you do, has that changed? So how many years are you involved in this, in your well, exercise programs? i 15 years at this myself. But, um, Can you see a change in attitude? Um, to some extent. I mean, to be honest with you, I think an awful lot of consultants and their allied teams, the specialist nurses and the physios and the non-consultant staff were sort of just waiting for a service like this to be to, I mean because suddenly then there was a place to send people with chronic illness. And I think as new and younger consultants are coming on stream, they are increasingly aware. So you're right, there is 
well, I wouldn't call it a fundamental change in attitude because I don't think I don't think many people in, in hospital settings were negative about it. Mm-hmm. It just wasn't available. But it is it is increasingly recognised as important. And I think the people involved at a management level in running the integrated care programmes for older persons in this country will state that the single most important intervention to facilitate healthy ageing is physical activity. And it's cheap, it's fun, and it works. Yeah. Amazing. And you, sorry, and was something I want to go back to. You talked about, you talk about your programs that every, you have one class kind of fits all, but you mentioned cancer separate on a number of occasions there. Can you explain what the difference is and how those programs run? Well, the content is no different, um, but there are a number of things about cancer. Like obviously, well, the first thing to say is that exercise helps prevent cancer. I mean, the only cancer that's recognized to be common on people exercise is skin cancer because of the exposure to the sun. Um, but for various reasons, different cancers are less common in people who exercise, whether that's due to reduced transit time of and of carcinogens with regard to bowel cancer or reduced levels of estrogen because of reduced adiposity in those cancers that are driven by estrogen, which include endometrial cancers. Whatever the reason, and like in lung cancer, it may be because it's associated with reduced smoking. So there's a prevention element, but from the moment of diagnosis, there is a role for exercise in cancer care, in the cancer pathways. And some of it's emotional because it allows the person to retain their identity if they're previously exercised and they're now suddenly sick and they either don't feel like it or they're being told not to. And apart from retaining identity, there is the issue or the uh, angle of retaining control of your health and having some input into your own health-related behaviour at a time when an awful lot of the decisions are being made by somebody else. So there's that. But secondly, there is the biological benefit. And during chemo or radiotherapy before surgery for a cancer, your fitness tends to plummet. And my research colleague, Lisa Lockney, Dr. Lockney, has done her work on this and has shown that during that um, what's called neoadjuvant phase of treatment, fitness plummets. Cardiovascular fitness just disimproves drastically. And if between finishing your chemo radiotherapy and having your surgery, if you exercise, you can regain your fitness. And if you don't exercise, you won't regain it, leading to going into your surgery either fit again or not, with the attendant benefits of that in relation to perioperative morbidity, fear of surgery, enhanced recovery. So that's that. Secondly, in people who have finished their primary treatment, which is where we started our cancer program and developed this 12-week intervention called Move On, that is moving on from your treatment phase to being a normal person again, a 12-week group exercise program, it was phenomenally successful and enjoyable. And consistently, the message we got from participants was that it helped me to do ordinary things, like I was getting dressed again, I was driving my car again, I was in a gym again, I never thought I'd see one again. And, and, and then they meet other people in the same boat, and it's fantastic. And then we started a program called Cancer Prepare, which was a program and is a program which offers intense exercise to people who are preparing for, for cancer, curative cancer surgery. So you meet your prostate surgeon today. He gives you the diagnosis. You meet us tomorrow because on his desk he has a flyer and he gives it to you and he tells you to expect a phone call from our team, which we do. And if your surgery is six weeks away, we ask you to come in and exercise with us. And it's very technical. We say as often as you can mm. for as much as you can. <laughs> and if you need a break, we'll give you a break. And you'll exercise with us and as well as that, you'll exercise at home. And what we have found about that program is a couple of things. First of all, we get very attached to the patients because we see them every day and we wave them off and it's quite emotional and all that. But what they tell us is, if we ask them, what's, what's, what did you enjoy about this or did you enjoy it? What was the most beneficial thing about this program? And the answer was, it was something to do. Rather than sitting looking out the window waiting for the Grim Reaper to arrive, I'm getting up and I am going somewhere and I'm meeting people and I'm inputting into my own health. I'm feeling better. I'm feeling more resilient. I'm more confident about the surgery. And I'm sharing the journey with other people who are in the same position as me. And guess what? I'm also meeting people who have come back following the surgery and they're still alive and they're doing great. So that program has been fantastic. We also offer, I mean, some cancers actually behave like long-term illnesses. So there are some categories of cancer, like, for example, long-term some long-term prostate cancer. It's like a chronic illness. Or some of the hematological cancers, like myeloma. It is known to remit and relapse over many years. And you need to stay well in that period. And some cancers are treated with long-term medication. And this would include prostate and also um, breast cancer and, and others as well, where those medications that are necessary and are used come with risks themselves, side effects of cardiometabolic disease, including increased risk of heart disease, for example. So therefore, to mitigate those risks, you need a healthy lifestyle based on exercise, which reduces 
the risk of cardiovascular disease anyway. And here you are in a situation where you're at increased risk of it because of necessary treatment. So it makes perfect sense. Um, so the cancer story is fantastic. And there's lots and lots of research building on the um, supporting the role of cancer, of, of, of exercise. And then there is the issue of does it actually reduce the recurrence risk, which is entirely separate. And I think there is emerging evidence that it does. So... And has it evolved from the Move On program that was just 10 weeks? Is it now a... Uh... Well, the Move On program it remains a finite get out when okay. you're finished program because yeah. it should. I mean, the idea is that you get on with your life. The um, well, unless you're on one of those long-term medications with those risks associated with it, in which case we'd like you to be exercising forever. Well, we would anyway like you to be exercising forever. But that doesn't mean you have to stay with us forever, even though you can. Uh, so you may graduate. So they can join the, the program with the other illnesses? Yeah. Yes, or they can do their own thing, like yeah. the Pluribel Paddlers in Grand Canal in Dublin is a fantastic example of a group that offers an exercise culture and opportunity to people recovering from cancer, breast cancer, and there's no, there's nothing medical about it. There's a few different pathways people can go. And if you are someone that has an illness and you're interested, but you might feel a little bit tentative about it, where can they get more information? Well, it depends where you are, I suppose. Um, in Dublin, you certainly be able to access one of our programmes and the few places I've mentioned earlier, our website excellentmedical.ie we'll have information about how you might access our, our um, online stuff but we're very hopeful that in the not too distant future there'll be an excellent centre near you no matter where you are Brilliant yeah and that's your vision as well so just to, you would like to see that everyone no matter where you are in the country you'd have access to an Exwell centre and, and to partner with, with as many people as possible who have a, a similar vision to us which is a social enterprise vision that this is necessary but I, I mean I call it exhilarating medicine whenever I get a chance because it is it is the most enjoyable way possible to spend your time as a doctor in my opinion it's great fun and it works that's the point it works it has impact oh no without a doubt and again from my first hand exposure to the programs particularly in the earlier years I can see that what you do like it makes us it definitely has a significant and a very real impact on people's lives so you are very much making a difference so it's it is it's amazing and I suppose before we wrap up I'm dying to ask you, what other exciting projects or is there anything outside of Xwell, anything else that you're working on or? No. <laughs> Xwell uh, has taken over my life and it will continue to. Now, there's some interesting projects that are arising in relation to Xwell. So, for example, we're doing a very interesting pilot project with a home care provider in Ballymun, Trinity Home Community Care, which is a charity. And um, the rationale there is that if we can leverage the staff in the home care organisation to bring the Exwell programme into the homes of people using their services, we can make a big difference because these people are at risk of three very, very well-recognised transitions which are life-transforming and expensive. One is becoming bed-bound, which then means a hoist and two carers instead of one. One is becoming hospitalised and one is needing to move into long-term residential care. And by enhancing wellness through appropriate exercise, we would hope to be able to defer or postpone or eliminate the risk of these transitions happening. And the point about it is these people, like we mentioned earlier, drop out as a big challenge. These people can't drop out. They can't escape because they're meeting their carers every day, sometimes three times a day, every day of the year, sometimes. So they, in theory, and there's an enormous number of people in receipt of home care services in this country. So that's a really interesting, that's a really interesting um, project for us. We're hoping soon to start a junior Exwell for children with long-term illness. And we are starting very soon a very exciting pilot with um, survivors of childhood and, and adolescent cancer called Canteen and we're doing it in, in a Canteen is one of the advocacy groups that we're working with and that's a very interesting um, project. Now Junior XL itself the concept is to you know offer an exercise opportunities to people with long term illness who are children and they might be cancer but the, the rationale there is that having an exercise experience normalises the school experience it normally like it it helps build, resi build resilience it provides a platform for relationship development and it also um, it builds confidence it affects the family dynamic of childhood illness and all that that's so complex and in addition it provides a platform for healthy adulthood so the rationale for offering this service to children is powerful but we recognize that it's a completely different challenge it's a completely different skill set offering exercise opportunities to children and adolescents compared with compared with adults and we need very skilled people for that who would probably come from the PE training background for teaching maybe 
um, and play therapy and clinical psychologists, you know. So we're very excited about that. Um, that's a really interesting project. And that's enough, I think, to keep yeah. us going. <laughs> <laughs> it's plenty. There's a few more as well, but that's yeah. good for the moment, yeah. Oh, no, no, well, honestly, just I think what you're doing really is incredible. And like I said, you're making a real difference and a real impact on the lives of so many. So I am delighted and so proud to be able to share your story. So thank you so much for your time. And thank you, Sarah, and the best of luck to you with this series. Thanks for tuning in to The Natural Health Revolution. We hope you have come away more informed and empowered to make little adjustments towards a happier, healthier way of life. We are dedicated to spreading the message of natural health and we hope that if you enjoyed this episode, you will join us again for more experts and insights from the fields of health, nutrition and well-being. We would love to hear from you. So if you have any questions or want to know more about us, you can find us online at circleoflight.ie and on all social media platforms.